As we prepare ourselves to come to the table, one of the most significant events that took place over the weekend that we have just remembered when our Lord was crucified and when He rose again was the whole issue of the blood of the Lamb that was shed for us. And I want to take a little bit of time this morning as we prepare to come to the table to look at what, what, it, what is it all about? Why is it so important? You know, why do we always talk about the blood? Why should Jesus have instituted the table and the cup when He said, this is the new covenant in my name? And He meant His blood poured out for us. You know, if we look at the whole issue of blood, you can't see my blood. It's well hidden. And for me to show you my blood, it's going to cost me. It's going to be a painful experience. I would have to cut my flesh, which I do often. And it's jolly sore. And the blood runs out. The other day I was sitting on the train and I was wondering why everybody was looking at me. And there was blood running down my face. And I didn't even know. That was not a painful experience. But I didn't know there was blood running out my nose. And the people were staring. Jesus said this. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, he says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Paul went on to add to that, and he said in one in Colossians 1:14. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood there is no remission. He also explained we have redemption through the blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Peter also added to this when he said in 1 Peter 1.18 We are not redeemed with silver and gold and precious stones, but with the precious blood of Christ. You cannot bring a gift big enough or expensive enough to pay for your redemption. It is impossible. Only the blood, the sinless blood of the Lamb, which you cannot purchase. We don't have sinless blood. Only Jesus did. And that's why there's so much power in this. And then of course John writes in 1 John 1 7 the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us power in the blood cleanses us from all sin now the early church fully understood the issue of blood in the book of Acts 22 times it's recorded the same message the death the burial and the resurrection of Christ. They understood that His death and the provision of the covering of the blood was the essential ingredient of the Gospel. And so if we look and we see blood, we see from these statements that there's something very powerful here. And we often overlook this, this power that's in the blood. But let's have a closer look at it this morning as we, as we prepare to come to the table. First of all, we'll see that the blood is perfect. No stain, nothing wrong. It is absolutely perfect. My blood is stained. My DNA is stained. Why? Because Adam passed down to me stained blood. Blood that has been corrupted. And so of course somewhere along the line somebody has to pay the full price of shedding their blood but it has to be perfect. It cannot be blood that is stained. It cannot be blood that is corrupted. Because then it would have to go on and on and on. There is no once and for all. And so we see that Jesus uh, at the virgin birth was born with 
blood that is pure. I wonder if scientists analyzed his blood, the difference that they would have seen in his blood and that of every other human being. I believe there was a difference because there was no corruption in it at all. Judas, even Judas, cried out, I have betrayed innocent blood. Paul says, for he, that's God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Even Pilate said in John, I find no fault in him at all. Jesus said of himself, which of you condemns me of sin? He also spoke of, uh, he was spoken of as holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens according to the writer to the Hebrews and again Peter he who did no sin neither was guile found in his mouth and finally John adds in him is no sin at all no sin you see the natural father we impart the corrupted blood to our children as we were corrupted as it was handed down to all of us from Adam. And so we carry this corruption in us. So something needs to be done because we cannot, we cannot go to the Father in this corrupted state. We need somebody that is pure and that is Jesus. His blood is perfect. In Matthew's Gospel chapter 1 and verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You know, it was a rare, I can't even describe how amazing this fact is that a woman became pregnant and bore a child, gave birth to a child, and that child was without sin. No corruption in his DNA. No corruption in his blood. Perfect. But you know, not only is his blood perfect, it is also completely pure. There's a gentleman by the name of Curtis Hudson, a doctor, struggling with his cancer. And on a number of times he went through a treatment called Kalitin, which is similar to dialysis. That the blood is removed from the body and sent through a machine which cleanses and removes the impurities from it before it pumps it back into the body. This treatment obviously extended his life. After, because this blood, when it was removed, it's cleansed of the germs, diseases and bad cells. And then put back in. Temporary. Again and again and again it has to be done. No once and for all. Just shows you a picture of our blood. Constantly there's impurities. Constantly there's bad things that have to be removed. The writer of the Hebrew puts it like this. In chapter 9 and verse 13 and 14 he says this. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkle the unclean, sanctify it to the purifying of the blood, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purged from our conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. There's an old song, it uh, goes like this, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me as white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And of course, Peter wrote, For as much as we know, know that we are not yet redeemed from corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Talks about the purifying, the purification process. This pure blood is without fault. 
We also see that the, this blood is perpetual. Is perpetual. You know, the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament were being offered again and again and again. Isn't it glorious not to come to church and have to sit here while somebody gets a goat and you know, cuts its throat and they bleed it into a basin and then they sprinkle the altar and they come in and they sprinkle it on your best Sunday suit. Can you imagine that every Sunday the same process? I wonder what people would think of us. Crazy. Look at these people. You know, go around cutting goats, chopping them up, blood everywhere. Can you imagine the mess? I mean, it wouldn't be nice and fancy like it is here. Yeah. And this is it. We don't have to do it anymore. It's done for us. Finished, and in my language we say, finished, claw and kaput. That means never ever to be done again. Wonderful. I can't imagine a mess more than having to do a sacrifice here every Sunday. And so this, when this pure blood is applied to me, what an amazing thing happens. What's another song, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Isn't it an amazing song that, as you look at it? It's just so exciting, again and again. <coughs> but you know, this blood, this blood that Paul talks about in Hebrews chapter 9, well, not Paul, but the writer to the Hebrews in 9.12, neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by his own blood. Jesus didn't put a goat on the altar. He put himself there. He offered Himself. He entered into, for once into the holy place. And having obtained eternal redemption for us. Amazing. He goes on in verse 26. But now once, but now once in the end of the world hath He appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. A little bit later in chapter 10. But of this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And so this blood of Christ has put into motion a forever perpetual cleansing. Finished. Not to be done again. It's over. And of course the Hebrew writer later says, the blood of the everlasting covenant. Just so amazing that this is once for all, never to be done again. And then of course, in John, in, uh, if we look a little bit further, we also see that not only is this blood with us perpetually having cleansed us, but it is also very powerful. Power is in the blood. Who can be free from the burden of sin? There is power in the blood. Would you over evil a victory win? What wonderful power in the blood. There is power. Power. Wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. How, how we sing these songs and sometimes uh, we just go way over them. And we don't see the truths that are written uh, in these songs as we sing them. John wrote in Revelation 5 verse 9, Thou hast redeemed us by us to God by thy blood. It's an amazing power. We're told to overcome. Jesus overcame Satan. How? He didn't fight him. He didn't go to war with him. He overcame him simply by his blood. That's all it took. The pure blood of Christ. But you know, this is probably the area that is attacked the most amongst the cults. It's the one area they cannot cope with. The Christian scientists, as they call themselves, Mary Baker Eady, wrote this. The material blood of Jesus is no more able to cleanse from sin when it was shed upon the cursed tree than when it ran through his veins. This woman was deluded. A Bible teacher in America wrote this. The red liquid... This is a Bible teacher. The red liquid that runs through the veins and arteries of Jesus' mortal body is not related to our salvation. What a lot of rubbish. It's the blood. 
Why? Because again, the writer to the Hebrews says this in chapter 9 and verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Nothing. And so we also see that this blood is also permanent. You know, the word acquit or acquittal is a very strong word. It means that it's finally paid off, cleared, absolved. There is no more recourse. When O.J. Simpson was acquitted of murder in court, there was nothing they could do to bring him to retrial. No amount of evidence could overturn the acquittal which had been given to him. And that's the same picture that we have. No amount of evidence that is presented can overturn what Jesus' blood has done for me. Nothing. It's permanent. You know, His blood covers our sins, both past, present, and even future. It does not give us license to sin, but it will even cover the things we haven't yet done. You know, when God looks at me, He looks at me through glasses that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Because that means washed in the blood of the Lamb. But the blood is also precious. I uh, recently came across a story of a, an old man who was a, a collector of Van Gogh and Monet paintings. Spent all his time traveling the world looking for any one of these rare paintings and would spend money to, at auctions to buy these. Him and his son had the same passion and they were both very, very uh, devoted art collectors, collecting the best all around the world. And one day his son was called up to go into the military and uh, he joined the, the, the military and served uh, in the medical corps, helping people. And after a while he was wounded and he died. The father, his father really grieved for him. He loved his son so much. Then one day, uh, there was a knock at the door, and uh, there was this young man also from the army, and he said, Sir, I served with your son in the military, and I have a present to give you. He said, I know how much you and your son love painting, and so I've painted this portrait of your son, and I want to present it to you. And so the old man opened this picture, and there was a portrait of his son, very good likeness, but it was just an ordinary painting. So the old man went into his lounge, he took down the Van Gogh from the mantelpiece and he put up the picture of his son in the most prominent display of all his art. And he sat for many days gazing and admiring this portrait of his son. Eventually he died. And as with all things that we own, it's not very long before it's put up for auction for somebody else to own. And so along came the auction. And, uh, the auctioneer announced the first thing that is required is that we sell the painting of the gentleman's son. And they hold up the picture and everybody went, oh, you know. He says it must be sold first. And now everybody's grumbling and unhappy and they're complaining. Come on, you know, we just want to get on with a real sale. And so the auctioneer says, what am I bid? What am I bid? Fifty dollars. Silence. $20. Silence. Bench an old man at the back, kind old gentleman, puts up his hand. Can I offer you $10? And so the auctioneer says, sold to the man for $10. And then he announces, the auction is closed. And everybody, what do you mean? We haven't even started bidding yet. Look at all these pictures. What are you going to do? Why aren't we going to... And he said, the world also goes on to say that the man who buys... The picture of his son gets all the paintings. So this man got all the Van Goghs and Monets for $10. That's what Jesus' blood buys us. You know, we look at it as, it's not really important. But that's what it buys us. Because it makes us co-heirs with Christ. 
everything that God has is yours and mine because of the blood of Christ. Isn't that amazing? That we would share in that inheritance that is in the Son. And lastly, the blood is also protective. Protects me. You know, in Exodus chapter 12, the blood was sprinkled on top of the doorpost so that when the angel of death moved through Egypt to kill all of the firstborn in the land, that meant every single firstborn would die. When the angel of death moved through and saw the blood on the lamppost, he would pass <coughs> over that home to the next home. Now there is a significant statement in the Old Testament that we can learn from and it applies to us. Are you covered with the blood of the Lamb? Do you live under His protection? Because He has shed His blood for you and He invites you to come under His protection. Uh, because it's said there in uh, Exodus 12, in verse 13, the blood shall be to you a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The picture of what is going to happen. You see, one day we will stand in front of God and we will all face the judgment. And that is where this promise is going to be real for us. Because God will look at us and you know what He will see? The blood. And He will pass over us and move on to the next one. The Satan will be there because he is the accuser of the brethren. And he will accuse us of all of the things we have done. But Father will see the blood and pass over and move on to the next. Are you covered by the blood of the Lamb? As we come to the table... Let us remember this, that it's the precious blood of the Lamb. When we take of that cup and we share of that cup together, it's the blood that cleanses. It's the blood that is precious. It is the blood which is powerful. It is the blood which protects us. May the Lord bless His word to us. Amen.